So welcome to the uh, lunch hour lecture. My name's Jonathan Montgomery. I'm a colleague of Kate's in UCL Laws, where I'm Professor of Healthcare Law. Um, my colleague, Dr. Kate Greasley, uh, is reasonably new to UCL, but is already making uh, an impact. Some of you may have snatched uh, on Radio 4's The Moral Maze, uh, and she won't thank me for saying if you didn't, <laughs> you can access it via the UCL Laws website. Uh, and she has an excellent book, uh, Arguments About Abortion, some of which I suspect we're about to hear about. Um, so, Kate, we're delighted to have you with us, uh, and welcome. Great. Thank you very much, Jonathan, and thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, I just hope that you didn't come with the expectation of getting answers on any of these questions, um, because we don't have time for it, and I'm much more in the business of posing the questions than giving the answers, unfortunately. Um, but the question, the main question, is abortion a morally permissible thing to do? Should it be a legally permitted thing to do? Should perhaps we permit abortion legally, even if we're convinced that it is immoral, or for people who are convinced that it is immoral? And then what does the morality of abortion depend on? Is it just a question of women's rights, rights to bodily autonomy, rights to procreative control? Or does it also depend on whether we think the embryo or fetus is a person with the right to life? Does that matter? So many people agree that this question, the question about the moral status of the fetus, is right at the core of conflict over abortion. And I think that that's basically correct. So I think that although a vast number of issues might be implicated in abortion ethics, at its philosophical heart, I think the abortion problem is a problem about what constitutes personhood. What makes a being a person with full moral rights and the right to life? And when in the trajectory of human development does that take place? So in the time that we have today, which is very limited, I just want to give a rough picture of how those that are engaged in abortion argument debate this question. So really just give a flavor of the problems that come up without sadly providing a whole lot in the way of answers. But I may make a couple of claims of my own about which moves in that debate I think are and aren't legitimate. So I'm starting with the centrality of fetal personhood, the question of why should we care? Why is it important what moral status we ascribe to the fetus for the ethics of abortion? So first things first, I need to explain what in the world I mean when I say person. It's not obvious. And how does that differ from the term human being? Because many people in this debate use the terms interchangeably, which can be a bit confusing. Moral philosophers tend to distinguish these two terms. So when they discuss abortion ethics, the term human being is usually taken to denote a biologically human organism. So just something that has human DNA, a life form that's human. Whereas the term person is taken to denote the category of morally important beings that we think possess the fundamental right to life. So these two terms don't mean the same thing. And we can see that easily just by reflecting on the fact that we can conceive of persons, I think, that aren't necessarily human beings. So if God exists, if you believe in God, that's clearly a non-human person. If we ever discovered intelligent alien life, like the Vulcans in Star Trek, they seem to be persons, but they aren't human. Or the apes from the movie The Planet of the Apes, it's a hypothetical example, but it's still an example of potential non-human persons. So while we all might agree that the zygote or embryo is a human being, it's definitely not a frog or a rabbit. It's, it's certainly human. It's still an open question as to whether all forms of human life are automatically persons. They could still be, but they aren't just by definition, because we can see that the two categories are at least conceptually separate. So with that kind of clarification in place, let me set out the kind of obvious, straightforward case for why the moral status or the personhood of the fetus is a central question for the morality and legality of abortion. So the simple argument just goes like this. Well, if the embryo is a person, then it follows that abortion is homicide. So what counts against abortion morally is that it involves homicide, right? violating the fetus's, the embryo's right to life. On the other side, weighing in favor of abortion, we have women's interest in bodily autonomy, 
which can only be protected by the right to end their pregnancy, if that's what they want. But the right to life, someone might say, and many people will think, is just stronger than the right to bodily autonomy. So ordinarily, the right to bodily autonomy can't justify intentionally killing another person so as to protect it, except maybe in extreme self-defense scenarios. So if abortion really is killing a person, killing someone like you and me with all of our rights, then it's probably impermissible in almost all circumstances, and maybe even to spare the woman quite severe physical and emotional burdens, maybe even in cases um, of pregnancy brought about by rape or incest. So that's a simple statement of the view that it is of critical moral importance whether or not the embryo or fetus is rightly regarded as a person in the philosophical sense for this debate about the ethics of abortion. But just so you know, because um, I think it's important to tell you, there is quite a lot of pushback against that claim. In fact, quite a huge body of the abortion ethics literature is dedicated to trying to show that abortion is morally permissible or that it at least ought to be legally permissible, regardless of how we answer that question about fecal moral status. So in other words, they're trying to show that even if the fetus were a person with the same moral rights as you have and I have, abortion should still be permitted. We just don't need to answer that difficult and quite intractable, maybe, question in order to get to the right conclusions on abortion. So I'm just going to summarize, just run through a few interesting arguments that could fit under this description. So firstly, and you have this on your handouts, some people might say that even if abortion is homicide, perhaps it's a justified case of homicide, like killing in self-defense, or maybe absolute necessity killing, where it's the lesser of two evils. So we do allow for justifications for homicide in law and in morality. Maybe abortion falls into that category. Second, some people might point to the counterproductiveness of abortion prohibitions and worries about things like backstreet abortions to argue that even if abortion is immoral, it still does far more harm than good to prohibit it, given that people are going to do it anyway. So regardless of the moral question, we have a legal answer. We should allow abortion. We should legalize it. Three, some people stress the distinctness of the moral and legal realms, and they claim that, well, even if abortion is immoral, there are some kinds of private immorality that the law just shouldn't get involved with. It's not the law's business. And we do think that about quite a few things. You might think that about adultery, about lying in your private life. So maybe abortion is like that. Maybe it's a form of immorality, if it is immoral, which I'm not saying it is. Um, which the law just ought to permit and stay out of. Fourthly, one further argument that abortion uh, should be permitted regardless of uh, the question of fetal moral status says that abortion actually isn't really like killing at all, but it's more like refusing to give someone life-saving bodily aid, which you aren't actually required, morally required, to donate. Um, so... I can't be morally required, I don't think, to donate my kidney to someone, even someone who needs my kidney and can only have my kidney to keep on living because I'm the only match. And the argument by analogy is that abortion is like that. A woman isn't morally required to endure all of the bodily burdens of pregnancy and the risks which are not negligible, even to keep another person alive. That's just too much to ask one person to do for another. And on this analysis, abortion is really just the refusal to be a good Samaritan. It's not really like killing at all. It's like saying, I can't save you, it costs me too much, and it's legitimate. It's too much of a sacrifice to keep another person alive, and therefore it's morally permissible, even if the fetus is a person. So I'm actually going to stick all these things to one side um, after telling you about these arguments, which is a bit anticlimactic, I'm sorry. Um, but although, that's because although I think they're very interesting, I think that ultimately none of these arguments actually manages to displace the central importance of the personhood question in abortion ethics and argument. Meaning, I don't think any of them successfully show that abortion is morally permissible or that it should be legally permissible regardless of whether the fetus 
is or isn't a person. Now, there are lots of reasons why I think that about each argument. We could talk about it later. Um, but I want to assume for now that that's true, because I think many people are actually in agreement with me about that. And especially most opponents of legal abortion would be in agreement about that. So I want to put all of those kinds of arguments to one side and assume it's true that if the fetus were a person, then abortion would almost always be morally impermissible and something that legally we ought to prohibit. So that brings us to the million dollar question, and this is going to be the interactive part of the lecture, but you'll just have to do the interactive part in your head. Um, when does morally meaningful human life or personhood, however you want to put it, begin? How do people even begin to argue about this? So we were going to display some plausible and popular options um, and get people to vote on which threshold they are uh, most drawn to as the threshold of personhood. Um, so here are some key benchmarks in human development um, that people tend to pick out when they're asked this question. We have conception, obviously, implantation, when an embryo properly attaches to the womb lining, viability, birth, then we have psychological criteria like consciousness or self-awareness, rationality, maybe communication ability. So the way that abortion argument at this point typically goes is that someone will suggest a threshold as that which corresponds to the beginning of personhood. And then the objections come thick and fast to the effect that there's something the matter with the threshold that it commits us to implications about who is in or out of the category of persons, which we wouldn't want to accept. So in other words, these are reductio ad absurdum arguments. That just means reducing something to the absurd, showing that it bears implications that we couldn't accept, and that proves the argument or the claim to be wrong. Or they might try to explain that the threshold is unacceptably arbitrary in some way, and hence we can't accept it. So let me just give you a few examples of how this would work with some benchmarks. So if we take birth, for instance, um, a lot of people like the idea that birth is the threshold of full moral rights and personhood. The problem, or the, the, the putative problem, the argument against it, is that birth is merely arbitrary, in that it doesn't pick out a morally transformative development at the beginning of human life. So the question that pro-lifers usually pose is, well, what is it about this passage down the vaginal canal, being one side or the other, that makes all the difference, the moral status of a human being? What changes during this event? Um, and how are full-term fetuses any morally different from, say, a neonate just an hour after birth? If we take viability, that's a different benchmark that the law at least seems to think is important. It's, it's embedded into our abortion law. And lots of other people do as well. So survivability outside of the womb. That people claim is arbitrary in that it's a moving goalpost. So late fetuses in countries with poor standards of neonatal care might not be viable. Whereas the same aged fetuses in countries with better standards of neonatal care for premature babies are. So does the right to life of a fetus really depend on which country it's in? Or what is the pace of medical advancements and neonatal advancements in that country? I mean, if someone invented an incubator tomorrow that was capable of sustaining a blastula, which is really a, just a bunch of cells um, very early on in pregnancy, it was capable of sustaining it outside the womb all the way through uh, to when it can survive normally, would all blastulas suddenly become persons on that day? That would seem to be a strange implication of the view that viability is the touchstone of personhood. Then we have um, the slightly more popular with defenders of abortion rights criteria, things like consciousness, rationality, communication ability, higher forms of cognition. Um, so these, these kinds of criteria are favored by people who think that strong interests in continued life depend on this kind of higher form of sentience. But they also come under a lot of pressure from counterexamples. They would be examples of born human beings who don't bear out those characteristics 
but who it might seem perverse to exclude from the category of persons. So young infants don't have reasoning ability. Clearly they don't. Um, and neither do some people with radical cognitive deficiencies. People in comas, or people in vegetative states, don't have self-consciousness. You know, they're comatose. How can we account for their personhood on these sorts of criteria? And so on, that's what the exercise will look like. And the question that will be posed is, well, how could these sorts of criteria be correct as a touchstone of personhood if they committed to excluding so many born human beings from the category of persons? So those are just some basic problems with maybe the most popular uh, putative thresholds of personhood. Now, defenders of the view that personhood actually begins at conception will want to argue that these kinds of counterexamples and arbitrariness problems really end up demonstrating that their favored threshold, conception, is the only threshold that can account for the personhood of everyone that we want to keep in the category. And that means, they might say, that only conception is acceptable, that that must be the correct one. So we should just give up on all post-conception thresholds and accept that conception is the beginning of personhood. That would be some people's argument. However, it's very important to note that their criterion of moral standing, which is simply going to be human and alive, presumably, is actually subject to some powerful reductio ad absurdum arguments as well. So here are a few. If it's true that full-blown personhood and moral rights begin at conception, the following implications will seem to hold, and I've just outlined them for you on your handouts. Um, one, the death of a single-celled zygote will be every bit as bad and should be mourned as much as the death of a 10-year-old child. That seems to follow from that view. Many people would struggle to accept that. Two, it would mean that natural spontaneous miscarriage is the greatest human tragedy afflicting humanity because it would be far worse in terms of the sheer numbers of deaths than natural disasters, disease, famine, malnutrition, basically everything else put together. Far more people will still die from natural miscarriage. So we should just take all the money that we put into all other charitable donations and plug it into miscarriage prevention research. Right? That seems to follow if you think that personhood starts at conception. It also would mean that most persons die prior to ever implanting in the womb. They don't even make it to birth, since most embryos don't actually survive past that stage of development. So do most people never get born? For many people, I think that would seem like an odd implication. Maybe it's true, but I think we would struggle to accept it. And finally, if personhood begins at conception, and if embryos really are the moral equivalents of infants, then it means if you were in a burning down building and you were faced with a dilemma of rescuing either five embryos in a canister or one human baby, and it was either the five or the one, for some reason you couldn't grab them both, that would mean that you should rescue the five embryos because in questions about whom to save, let's say they're all strangers to you, they're not your embryos, you should save the most number of children. Right? That's the reasonable thing to do. This is called the embryo rescue case thought experiment. Now, I think almost everyone would, would reject that implication. Right? Most people would say, no, surely that can't be right, and that's not what I would do in that situation. But it seems to follow from the idea that person who begins at conception. So these are all some highly implausible claims that seem to be inescapable on the personhood from conception view. But that view also faces a much more basic logical problem. So, supporters of the idea that personhood begins at conception presumably think that the criterion of moral standing is simply human species membership, right? Or the possession of a complete set of human DNA. Now, that, of course, invites the further question, well, what is it about human DNA, about just being human, that warrants special moral protection? You know, why, in other words? You can't just state it, you can't just assert it. There has to be a reason. Now, if defenders of that view can't produce an answer to this, their answer is just because it's human. 
which is not an answer. Then they're going to expose themselves to the charge that their criterion of personhood is just what people call speciesist, right? meaning that it demonstrates an arbitrary species preference, not a morally justified one. On the other hand, if they try to argue that the reason why human beings are so especially valuable is because of the higher forms of, co of cognition of which they're capable, right? because they're so highly emotive, complex, rational, communicating, et cetera, et cetera. But that, of course, invites the obvious challenge. Well, but not all human beings are like that. Right? If that's really the touchstone, if that's your criterion of moral standing, and that's the reason why you think humans are important, that doesn't apply to all human beings. And it certainly doesn't include zygotes and embryos and probably fetuses as well. So that's a serious uh, logical problem that any defender of the conception threshold is going to need to surmount. It's not really enough for them to just say, well, there are counterexamples to these other criteria. There are counterexamples to their criterion as well. So I'm going to move on to a different problem now and just leave all that just hanging in the air for you to make of what you will. Um, the next thing that I want to talk about is a different kind of arbitrariness worry that comes up quite a lot in public debate about abortion, especially surrounding this question of cutoff points. And that's a worry which defenders of the view that personhood begins at conception again think benefits their account and invalidates all post-conception thresholds of personhood. So the argument runs that every post-conception threshold of personhood someone might support is arbitrary in a very particular way. It's arbitrary in the sense that we won't be able to give reasons to distinguish it from its very closest neighboring points. So I'll use the example of birth to demonstrate what I mean by that. So somebody says to you, I think birth is when human beings become persons. Somebody might ask in response, well, what do you mean? Which moment exactly within birth do you think is contemporaneous with the beginning of personhood? Is it when the first part of the baby first starts to emerge from the woman? Or is it only once it gets out as far as the navel? Or does it take another couple of inches again? Right? People can keep asking these sorts of questions. And whichever point someone might pick, right, this point, navel, that inch, somebody might pose the question, well, why not an inch further or an inch farther back? And of course, there won't be an answer to that question. There won't be anything morally distinguishing between these inches. Likewise, suppose we argue that the threshold for personhood is, say, 25 weeks gestation, which is around the time that some neurologists think that synapses in the brain start to begin to form, and, and uh, the, connection, the connections between synapses is what facilitates consciousness. But again, the question might be posed, well, if you're going to say 25 weeks, why not 24 weeks and six days? What changes in that extra day? Or come to that, what changes in that hour? Why not an hour before? Or why not an hour later? Or minutes or seconds? Right? You can see how the argument might go on ad infinitum. So some people might claim that if a threshold of personhood or a corresponding cutoff point for abortion can't be distinguished in this sort of decisive way, then we can't accept it. Or at least that's what they seem to be claiming, right? When they ask these questions, what do you mean birth? When exactly in birth? How do you get there? How do you get to that inch? That's the presumption, right? That they think if you can't distinguish in this very particular way, there's something wrong with the threshold. But they must also think that conception isn't arbitrary in that way, right? That conception, unlike all of these post-conception thresholds and developments, really is a decisive point of moral transformation. The only conception is non-arbitrarily distinguishable as a point in human development. So there are two things that I want to say about this particular kind of arbitrariness worry, which I hope I've given the picture of what it's like. The first thing I want to say is that it's not actually true that the conception threshold evades this form of arbitrariness. And that's because conception, in fact, isn't a decisive moment either. It's a process. 
In fact, it's a process that takes 24 hours around. And like all other processes, it's comprised of infinitely divisible smaller moments. So to illustrate, somebody might ask the question, well, you say conception is when personhood begins. So when exactly in conception are you thinking about? Is it when the sperm first meets the membrane of the egg? Or is it when it first begins to penetrate the membrane of the egg? Is it when the nuclei of the two sex cells first begin to fuse or in the middle of their fusing? Which millisecond, someone might say, right? even if you specify to the millisecond, they could ask you, well, if you're going to say then, right, this millisecond, why not the millisecond before that or the millisecond after? How can you explain? How can you distinguish between the closest neighboring points? Isn't it just arbitrary? And you see how this is exactly the same kind of arbitrariness, worry, and thinking that I was demonstrating around the birth threshold as well. It's the same thing. So if this sort of arbitrariness is a problem, this very particular kind, that of distinguishing a threshold from its closest neighboring points, then we actually don't escape it by supporting the conception threshold. Right? It's there too. And that brings me to my second point. What would someone have to believe about the nature of personhood to think that this sort of arbitrariness is a problem? Right? Is a problem that ought to be surmounted or is a problem that can be surmounted? So the entire thrust of this kind of arbitrariness critique of personhood thresholds assumes something, I think, about personhood that we might not have good reason to believe, or at least we want to reflect on whether we believe it, should we believe it. And that's that it assumes that personhood is a sharp, non-arbitrarily distinguishable borderline. It assumes that it really does come, out, come about suddenly and instantly and completely. One philosopher put it, he calls it the existential pop view. Right? The, moment one, the idea that at one point you have just a mass of tissue or a human being, nothing morally considerable, or sex cells, and pop, then you have a person. And that's how we need to think about the personhood threshold. But it might be worth reflecting a little bit about what we need to believe in order to adopt such a view about how personhood begins. Or why would we think that personhood begins that way? Like many other things, I'm going to leave that hanging in the air, right, for you to think yourselves about what further kinds of beliefs would sponsor such a view. But we could contrast a very different view about how personhood begins. And according to a different view, personhood might just, like many other things, be a quality or a characteristic that begins vaguely and gradually, not in an instant and not in a non-arbitrarily distinguishable moment. So many characteristics that we possess come about vaguely in precisely this way. So consider, I'm an adult now, or at least I think I am on most days, depends on the day. I was a child at some point in my life. There's no day or hour or minute when I went from being one to the other. But I definitely did, right? It definitely did happen. It just happened vaguely and gradually. And so many things are like this. So if we think, if we did have reason to believe that personhood is fundamentally constituted by psychological capacities, things like self-consciousness and sentient experience, then the fact that these capacities themselves seem to fade in gradually, which clearly they do, right? Beings don't go from being not self-conscious to being self-conscious all of a sudden. Then once we assume that, we might no longer be looking for an instant threshold of personhood, a non-arbitrarily distinguishable moment, because we no longer believe that such a moment actually exists so as to be found, right? It can't invalidate a personhood threshold that it fails to meet a standard that ought not to be there in the first place, right? That relies on 
further beliefs about what personhood is like that we don't have reason to accept. So instead, we might think that the most we can do when reflecting on a threshold, especially a practical threshold, which is what abortion law needs to decide on, is to mark out the period during which we believe that personhood and moral rights are materializing, this vague period, and for legal purposes, perhaps stipulate a workable cutoff point somewhere within that range. So this last part here about the ultimate need for stipulation is quite important. So any practical threshold in this topic will have to be partly stipulative. And that's because the kinds of arbitrariness we've been considering is insurmountable in all events. We can't get around it. There really is no reason why a 25-week cutoff shouldn't be 24 weeks and six days, or why birth shouldn't be this inch or this inch, right? There is no reason. But of course, that doesn't mean it's just a free-for-all, right? And it's just relative, and it's reasonable to place the line absolutely anywhere. Or it doesn't mean that the sensible response to that problem is to support the conception threshold. Because that would be like saying that because we can't explain why the minimum driving age is 17, and not the day before someone's 17th birthday, we might as well let babies drive. Right? That would be an unreasonable response to this kind of arbitrariness problem around that threshold. So it's a common fallacy that no sharp edges means no real difference. And it's a fallacy that gets employed quite frequently in abortion debate. This kind of arbitrariness just can't be an invalidating feature of a cutoff point for abortion. So this kind of argument in particular surrounding thresholds is one that I think is invalid. And with this problem out the way, I think there should be more room to concentrate on questions that are actually more relevant to where is a reasonable place to draw the line with abortion. So I'll leave it there um, and let us get on to questions because otherwise we'll run out of time. Thank you very much, Kate. Um, I think the title of this was Taboo Ethics of Abortion, wasn't it? I'm not sure taboo is quite the right word for abortion because we don't find it difficult to talk about it, but we do find it very difficult to talk about it clearly and precisely, and we're very grateful for uh, such a clear and precise uh, explanation of what might be at stake. And we only have about five minutes, so what I'd like to do is to see if I can just take three questions, one from each of the banks of the seats, and give ch Kate a chance to take a gulp of water and... Uh, think about some answers. So do I have a question from this? <coughs> You're not obliged to do so, but anything you say <laughs> may be taken down <laughs> and uh, put onto YouTube. I don't from that. I do have one in right in the middle, please. Obliged. And do I have one coming from my left? I don't know, because I do. So you may be on your own, so your oh, question, okay. please. Uh, uh, thank you very much. This was really interesting. I think that it it's useful in this debate to put some like fixed points at least on how to reason about stuff so right. thank you about it and I think it's really compelling what you say about the unavoidability of having to stipulate something in terms of law and policy right so one thing that you haven't mentioned and that I think I mean it appears to me to be key in this debate mm. is the capacity for suffering of right, someone yeah. right yeah. so and how this fits with the worldview on the, each side of the abortion debate. Because I think that a morally transparent way of thinking about this is, let's say at 25, whatever, X we weeks, there's capacity for suffering. Right. Let's bring it to be sure to 20, I don't know. Yeah. And then let's construct the system in order to minimize suffering. Yeah. But the problem is, uh, that, yeah, so why, the, my first question is, is this approach legitimate? And my second question is, in someone's worldview uh, that you might think of like, I don't know, conservative versus progressive, mm -hmm. something like that. As a progressive, I think, okay, if my objective is to minimize suffering, then maybe abortion is permitted and then I take a certain stance on um, uh, I don't know, uh, contraception, I take a certain stance on the welfare in general, mm 
but I really struggle to find how the conservative uh, arguments against abortions are usually coupled with uh, with uh, uh, so, so trying not. Let's yeah. give Kay a chance to answer. We only have about three minutes. Let's, Sorry. Kay, how okay. could you not mention at UCL um, capacity for suffering? <laughs> because of Jeremy Bentham. Yes, yeah, so that's a really good question. So, um, yeah, we seem to care about the capacity for suffering, irrelevant of whether we ascribe full moral rights or personhood status to the sufferer. Um, so if you're a vegetarian, or even if you're not a vegetarian, you care about animal suffering, even if you don't think that animals are persons. So if we think that fetuses can suffer... Um, that would suggest that it's right that we should care about fetal suffering, whether or not um, they're persons. And I think that that's right. Um, I mean, it brings up the question as an empirical question, right, isn't it? Can fetuses suffer? Do they experience pain? Now, I have looked into this a little bit, and as far as I'm aware, there's some disagreement about that. And the reason why there's disagreement is that pain psychologists disagree about what is actually required for the subjective experience of pain as something unpleasant. So some psychologists say, well, you know, uh, a 12-week embryo flinches when it's prodded. And others say, well, so do insects. But you need a fully working kind of, you know, uh, frontal cortex so as to not just have the physical responses of pain, but experience pain as something unpleasant. So in short, there's a debate going on around that. And then, of course, there's the relevance question. You know, does it matter? So if fetal pain were really the main issue with late abortion, you would expect opponents of late abortion to be satisfied if we, say, just delivered anesthetics to late fetuses before aborting them. Um, now, I don't think they would be. I don't think that would placate worries about late abortion. And I think maybe that tells us that in late abortion and when people kind of recoil against that, they're actually recoiling against something other than just the idea of suffering. Just wait for the mic, because otherwise we, we can't all yes. hear you. It's a strange lecture theatre. Um, the technology is not entirely helpful. <laughs> it's not our friend today. Um, I had a quick question, but I just wanted to add a point to what you just said yeah. about suffering, and that is normally if we're terminating beyond 23 weeks, um, the fetus would get potassium yeah. into the heart, so you would actually um, ensure that the baby has died, check yeah, that the heart has stopped beating before you go on to perform the termination. Um, and my, my question was, um, in this framework, does the reason for the termination Matthew. play into the ethics of yeah. abortion? Yeah, very so, good question. So that's your last question, I'm afraid, Kate. Ah. So uh, off you go. It's a very good question. So I th it's a great question to ask anyone who supports abortion rights, right? Is there a bad reason for a termination? Now, the difficult thing is, this is what I think, when you start to try to imagine what a bad reason would be, I think when we try to make those cases realistic, we end up kind of struggling. So the kind of paradigmatic example is people say, well, what if a woman, you know, has a termination at 25 weeks because it interferes with a booked holiday, right? Surely that's an example of, unre of, or, sorry, of an unreasonable abortion. Now, instinctively, I, I would want to say, yes, probably, um, but then there are a few more questions to ask, right? So what would be going on with somebody to have a termination that late for that reason? I would struggle to believe that that's really the only thing happening. I mean, we at least know something, right? We know that she really doesn't want to be a mother or a mother again. And she really doesn't want to be a mother so badly that she's willing to go through a late-term abortion, which is a really extreme thing to do actually, if you think about it, so as to avoid being a mother. Um, or perhaps she's uh, struggling with mental health issues, right? When we think about someone who would have such a late abortion for that reason, it seems like it, it's, it's not a very normal thing to do. And if that's the case, then again, it's not going to be as simple as that, right? That that's really the reason she's having it. So I think when we talk about reasons, it can actually be really important to make the cases realistic. Much as I would love to let you talk yeah. more about that, Kate, because it's very interesting. I, I can't. Uh, Kate is a multimedia person. You've heard her talk in the flesh. You can listen to her on Radio 4 via the UCL Laws website. This will be available on YouTube. Uh, I have a few flyers she's given me to give you a discount on her book, if you'd like that. Uh, it's been a fantastic lunchtime. Thank you very much, Kate. Can I invite you to thank her? <laughs>